Hi, my name is Tom Buckner. I'm the uh, artistic director and founder of the Interpretations Concert Series. And uh, I want to tell you about a very exciting event that we're doing in 2015. We're devoting our season's budget to celebrating the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians. So we're beginning in February uh, with a wonderful percussionist Thurman Barker and his Strike Force Plus Ensemble and the, the wonderful Amina Claudine Myers on piano with her long-standing trio of Jerome Harris on bass, guitar, and Reggie Nicholson on drums. The following month in March I'll do my annual concert. This year will be devoted entirely to composers of the AACM. Six of the senior members have written pieces for me over the years, and I'm doing some of them. My first association with AACM musicians came in 1968. I was visiting my friend David Wessel. We had both gone to Stanford together and uh, started doing free improvisation there. And in 68, Roscoe Mitchell, Lester Bowie, and Malachi Favors came to the West Coast, and David found them a very small house across the street from where he lived in East Palo Alto. I went to visit David for dinner, and we heard music coming out of the uh, house next door, and he told me who it was, was there. Uh, we had our dinner, and we visited through the whole evening. Live music was coming out of this house. Went to sleep with the music in our ears. Woke up the next morning with music coming out of the house still in our ears. And went across the street to say hello and see what in the world was going on. And the setup was Roscoe had his percussion cage, huge. He was completely surrounded by percussion. They had come out with their all their equipment. They came to, to rehearse and work and to perform and just to you know, get out of Chicago in the winter. <laughs> and uh, uh, Joseph Jarman had also been a member of the group then, but he was busy with another project. So it was just the three who came out. Uh, this was the group that was to become the Art Ensemble of Chicago. Um, uh, so Roscoe had his percussion set up and all his saxophones and Lester had his trumpet and a little bass drum, bass drum he was using, which he ended up not continuing with, and Malachi had his percussion set up and his bass, and they each had a bedroll uh, next to their instruments. And what they did was practice all day and into the evening, every day, except when they went out to uh, earn some money or to buy some groceries. And I thought I was a serious musician because I practiced a lot, but when I saw this, it changed my life. And I started really paying attention to these guys. And uh, to me, an art ensemble of Chicago performance was, became like a spiritual experience. I mean, it was just a, an astounding uh, focus. Then I began to learn where they came from and about the concepts of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, which was uh, founded, as I said, 50 years ago. And uh, it was no accident. They had principles and ideas about how the music should be treated, how they should uh, do, uh, take it out of the jazz clubs and put it in concert halls and perform it in community centers and train themselves in all aspects of music, composition, improvisation, all traditions. It was a, an astounding thing and many, many, many great people came out of this organization. I became aware of Muhal Richard Abrams' work very early on in my learning about the AACM. Uh, he was one of the founders of the organization and uh, it came out of a project he had in Chicago called the Experimental Band, where uh, the members of the band, where they got together and rehearsed and, and performed only music written by members of the band. And everybody was asked to bring something. And uh, he knew all being senior to the rest of them. If some of them didn't know enough about composing, he would show them. And uh, this was the uh, group out of which the AACM uh, evolved.
Roscoe heard a lot of people out there, and a few years later, uh, in the late 70s, quite a bit later, he was curating a summer of workshops for Carl Berger and Ornette Coleman's uh, Creative Music Studios. And one of the people he invited to teach was Gerald Oshita. At the end of your time there, the tradition was you gave a solo concert and you could invite one guest. That particular year, Gerald and I had just re-met. I've been on the East Coast visiting my mother with my kids, and so I was able to uh, get over there to Woodstock and perform in the last piece. And uh, when uh, we finished our duo, Bosco Mitchell, who was my hero, I had all these recordings of our ensemble, and I'd been to hear them play a few times, came up to me and Gerald and said, let's be a trio. That was the beginning of our trio space, which got me out on the road. Everybody has the story about what got them out on the road. That was one for me. And uh, we worked together from then until Gerald's untimely death in the early 90s at the age of 50. Uh, but Roscoe and I continued to work. We do projects every year. And uh, I was very interested in his compositional activity. He wrote compositions for our trio. and. Uh, I had started working with the great pianist Joe Kubera, who has was just a remarkably dedicated new music pianist. Um, and uh, we commissioned a piece from Roscoe that was to be more than a song, a duo for voice and piano, where the piano part was to be as elaborate and virtuosic as possible uh, uh, to go with the voice part. That piece will be performed in this concert. It's uh, settings of three poems by E.E. E. Cummings. Because it's this and dim. And then uh, Roscoe also wrote a very virtuosic uh, piano piece for Joe called 8888. Mr. Mitchell is very interested in numerology and it happened to be the 8th of Aug August 1988 when he wrote the piece, so he named it that. A decade and a month later, he wrote another piece for us called 9999. <laughs> and there are other number of pieces around for a minute later. But uh, Joe will also play that as a solo. And then uh, what seems to be most in need of being heard from the members of the AACM that I personally know is their remarkable activity as composers. They've really reasserted the role of the composer in what has been traditionally a more improvised form where people improvise on other people's tunes. One of their principles seems to be uh, that they performed only their own music and the music of their circle. Over the years, I got to know a number of other ASM composers. The first one I met through Bosco was Leroy Jenkins, the late Leroy Jenkins. Leroy was a, a, an astoundingly ambitious and prolific and really talented composer and violinist and violist. And he wrote for me a number of pieces. The one I'm going to perform is my favorite, uh, typical of his wonderful, deep humanitarian uh, concerns. Uh, he and I were talking about finding a subject for a piece that would really mean something to us. And he had noticed on the New York Times front page an article about during the severe homeless crisis in the uh, in the 80s, um, there had been homeless people who had been for a long time living in the uh, abandoned railroad tunnels on the Upper West Side. Uh, and when the homelessness got so bad, other homeless people tried to move in with them. And these people living in the caves, they didn't like it. And it became a news item that they were upset with the, with the people who were one rung below them for coming in, uh, you know, messing up their situation in their opinion. So he wrote this piece, uh, he, he took this article and we gave it to the really talented uh, writer, A.N.T. Green, who made kind of a libretto for a solo piece with uh, Leroy was going to play in the piece, which was an honor for me. He played viola and then we had a uh, uh, flute. Uh, and. Uh, it was a very special piece. It's called Dream of Dreams of Home. The next 
AACM composer that I met in New York was Henry Threadgill, uh, and uh, over the years he's written me a number of pieces, but for this occasion, it happens to coincide with my having recently commissioned a new piece from him. So we'll be doing a, a, a premiere of a piece by Henry Threadgill uh, called Shape of Things. Uh, it's for baritone voice, marimba, tuned rototom percussion, and cello. And uh, most of it is thoroughly written out, but it has sections that use Henry's remarkable improvisational system that he's developed over the years. Uh, and he's, I'm personally very fascinated by the various ways different composers, whether from the jazz tradition as these men are, or, or uh, uh, in, in new music, what they choose to control and what they choose to leave more to the discretion of the performer. And in this case, uh, there'll be wordless sections uh, where we'll be using Henry's improvisation system and the rest of it is the setting of, again, in this case, a text of his own uh, that he wrote. Uh, it's a very challenging and enjoyable piece. And I got to know Wadada Leo Smith and over the years we've done a number of projects together. And uh, when I talked to Wadada about this, uh, he was working on a new project that he was planning to write a piece that would include me in, based on the writings of uh, Henry David Thoreau. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, some some ideas from uh, civil disobedience. One of my favorite <laughs> things to read. His music has a, 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 another approach to what one controls and what one leaves open. Or in this case, it's a totally notated piece. But the vertical relationships, the harmonic relationships, are controlled to varying degrees. Sometimes there are specific things that happen at the same time, but many times with systems of repeats uh, inside of other repeats and things, you end up having uh, unmetered music. It's very difficult to write music that sounds unmetered when you don't hear where the one is. We, as Brasco Mitchell said, he always likes to try, to try to find a way to write pieces where you don't hear the bar lines. Uh, and uh, uh, Leo's system, uh, there'll be some improvisation sections, uh, and uh, most of the written sections will have this system where he, t he times it so that when you actually do it at the tempo that he suggests, you end up together. But each time you do it, the relationship between the, the uh, uh, melodic material uh, or the ongoing rhythmic material of the percussion will, will, will be different. So it's a, it's, it really has a sound of its own, which is a, actually you can get a sound of your own with any form of notation, but it's interesting that he's chosen to use a different kind of notation to get the sound he wants. I remember I wanted to invite Muhal to do a concert in interpretations, and uh, he agreed to do it. In organizing his concert, and then when I heard it, uh, it became clear to me that this person was very approachable, and that, that uh, uh, I could uh, talk to him about making a piece. And he made a piece for me for uh, Baritone and String Quartet, which was evocatively entitled baritone and string quartet. And we recorded it, and it, it's on a CD of Google's music, and it's one of my favorite things I've done. So last year, Mool had an idea for a project, and I came to the conclusion one of my curatorial choices and in interpretations is, whenever Mool has an idea for a project, I'll do it. And it had a large ensemble of people, and it had, again, a very unusual way of combining improvisation words, all, all the words written by Mughal, uh, different languages. He wanted me to find two other singers, each of which sang in a different language. Uh, and uh, uh, it turned out some of the instrumentalists could speak different languages too, so they did that too. It was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful long form piece. Uh, and uh, in that piece were a song for voice and piano for me and Joe Cabrera to play, 
and a solo piano piece by Joe. But these were rather short because they were part of a big long structure with many other material for all the other players. So I asked Mahal if he would add to that another song for voice and piano and another piano solo piece. And that's the piece, uh, Inner Outer Song Cycle, that we will be performing of Mahal's. Uh, well, our series is called Interpretations, and one of its focuses is to nurture the, the relationship between the community of new music composers and the community of virtuosic interpreters that has developed uh, in order to uh, present their work uh, in the highest po possible way. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be joined in this concert by some remarkable musicians. First, I want to mention Joseph Kubera, who I, whose work I first got to know back in the 70s when I was in California, and he was out there as well. Uh, so Joe and I, as soon as I, when I came back to New York, he came down from Buffalo around the same time, and we immediately hooked up, and he's been my partner in crime for many, 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 many years. Um, and it's a phenomenal experience to work with somebody so talented and so dedicated. Uh, for Amina Claudine Myers' piece, however, I felt that it would be important to ask her if she would accompany me because her style is so unique and uh, I don't think it would be, uh, that it would make, make, it, make it be much better if she would and she agreed and it's been really fun working with her on it and beginning to get to understand the style better. Uh, after Leroy died, we had a memorial, we had a memorial for the book that I was asked to put together Dream, Dreams of Home again. And uh, uh, Stephanie Griffin agreed to play the, uh, the old part, which is a well, big shoes to fill because Leo, <laughs> Leroy had played it in the original. And uh, it is, uh, she did a fantastic job. I decided to uh, invite my dear friend J.D. Perrin, a multi-instrumentalist, uh, who include, and then Christopher Hoffman, who's playing cello, is a longtime member of Henry Threadgill's uh, Zoid Ensemble, and is, a, uh, you know, with ob the obvious choice to do the cello part of Henry's piece, and, and since we had a cellist, we had used him in another piece as well, uh, in, uh, in uh, without a Leo Smith's piece. Then I went to one of the SEM ensemble concerts. I often get my players from the SEM ensemble. And uh, uh, there was a young percussionist playing there that I remember from other concerts really liking. And I spoke to him, uh, Alex Lebowski, and turns out he's a, a performer in and one of the directors of the wonderful Talia Ensemble. And uh, he agreed to do it, and we needed a second percussionist. Uh, uh, he invited his colleague in that ensemble, Matthew Gold. I've heard both these people play in many occasions and sung in ensembles that they played in and really thrilled that they're involved in the project. Uh, so it's going to be a wonderful experience for us to do a concert here in New York and then the next day fly out to California and do the, the same thing uh, in, in the Bay Area on the uh, following Sunday. Uh, I think if you come to this concert, you'll be glad you did, and so will I.